this thing up for that just in because that's what the day is about, right? It's an awesome, awesome day that this represents. You guys look good today. And if you all allow me, and if you're a regular around here, I'm going to break stride here just for a little bit this morning. And, um, we, in fact, are not going to be finishing up the Lion King today. I just had a stir in my spirit last night. Just, and I guess that's my prerogative. I feel like going to do the correction when we can all go with me, right? For better, for worse. And I, I thought that was interesting, the, the little commercial for Jaws that said, um, it's like next week in two weeks. Did anyone notice that besides me? <laughs> And I tell you, somebody got half of that right. It's going to be two weeks from the day before we start that. So it'll, the next week will be one week. But um, So hold on for the right. It's here at the movies at Cornerstone Family Church. And we've, we've had some incredible, incredible times here um, with seasonal teaching here through Transformers and all kinds of stuff. And, and the, for those of you that are just real curious about what in the world could Jaws be about, don't miss it, okay? So if you're just visiting, you're looking for a place to plug in that I promise you, you will not go to sleep in church. This is your place. If you're tired of church as usual, you may have found a place to check out for a while, okay? Thank you, guys. I just want to say before we get started, thank you for everyone who's just jumped in this week and worked so hard. And we um, hosted the, the Community Holy Week service here Friday. Thank you for all the wonderful things you guys did to make that happen. And all the people that's plugging holes today as we're paying the price for... Um, for uh, spring break being the week after Easter, we have a lot of people that take off early and um, for vacation. Thank you for everyone who's plugging the hole back in the multimedia and around with sound. Thank you for all that. And our multimedia team, and they're just awesome. I don't know if you know or not, but, but most of what you see on these screens, they produce in-house right here. And, um, Tim Oliver, thank you for putting together the, um, the Passions video with that song. It's just, uh, I'm just amazed that people can take this and sync it with this and it just be perfect. And, and, and to be so moving. Just thank you for your gifts and your talents and how that you're using them. Once you can make a, a transformer talk to you personally, you know you've hit your stride then, right? All right, here's what today is about. Look at this passage in 1 John, verse, or in John 20, beginning with verse 1. It says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put Him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at all the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, which is John, <coughs> this story is about Peter and John, and also went inside and he saw and believed. And they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had, say had, had, to rise from the dead. That's a very important day to our faith. It's a, even though I'm a, a little bit, uh, obviously I'm a guy who likes to live on the edge. There's not a traditional bone in my body, but the word tradition isn't all bad. You know what I'm saying? It's dead traditions are bad. There are some traditions that are actually very, very important. How many of you guys would say you traditionally eat every day? You traditionally sleep. You traditionally do many other things that if you did not do, you would begin to stink. And so we understand tradition within itself is not a bad word. And so for me this time of year, it's very important for the body of Christ to plug in together. You know, on Good Friday communions, when we come and we remember the work of the cross together, it is very important according to the directives of Scripture that we gather together and we take time and we remember together what has happened. And Easter morning, what most of us call Resurrection Day, very important that we come and we remember the resurrection. 2,000 years removed from the resurrection and I'm afraid that what was going on with the disciples might still be going on. So they didn't understand that He had to rise from the dead. And how many times did Jesus tell them person, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, don't freak out, I'm going to come back to life. And how many times did He say things like that and they just 
couldn't hear what he was saying. There was always confusion about that. The Sadducees were, were, were those who was that group of, of religious folks um, who did not even believe in a resurrection. And that's why they were sad, you see? <laughs> I never get tired of using that, and I never will. So. The Pharisees did, um, but the Sadducees did not. And, and so there was one time the Sadducees were, even, they were trying to trick Jesus with the resurrection question. They said, Jesus, when um, there, there was a, a woman and her husband died, and it's as customary in Hebrew culture, uh, the next brother in line took her as his wife and took care of her, but then he died too. And then the next brother in line took her as his wife, and then they all died, and they went to Abraham's bosom and said, which one is actually going to be her husband there? They can't all three be. Jesus basically just said this. He said, ah, concerning the resurrection, there's so much you don't understand. Never really answered their question with the clarity that they were wanting. He never fell into their traps. But he, he made that statement that still rings true today. There's so much about the resurrection we don't understand. So much. The people in that day did believe that you could rise from the dead. The people around Jesus especially believed that you could rise from the dead because they had seen it. Anyone that would follow Jesus around. And that was what was so weird about the disciples. They had watched Jesus raise people from the dead. And they still were having a tough time really trying to process this thing. They saw Jairus' daughter, a 12-year-old girl, raised from the dead. We're going to talk about her a little bit more next week. They said she's dead. There's no point in, in, in even going to the room. Jesus said she's only sleeping. And of course, she was dead. Physically speaking, she was dead. And Jesus raised her back to life. There was the, um, the widow of Nain and her son. And that was the, one of the most moving stories in the Bible to me because Jesus and his disciples were coming into, into that small town and they were, they, they, their journey was disrupted by a funeral procession. And as it came out the, the, down the road, Jesus saw a little widow woman bent over and crying and weeping, her heart just being poured out. And he stopped the procession and says, what's going on here? And she says, my son, my only son has died. Jesus, full of compassion, could not leave that the way it was. And he raised the boy back to life. And we're all familiar with the story of Lazarus. Lazarus, a, a, a foreshadowing of where, uh, of Jesus, just, just um, within days after the event of raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus was foreshadowing his own death because over the time period of three days, Lazarus lay in the tomb when Jesus came and raised him back to life. People knew that you could be raised from the dead. The Pharisees actually believed that. In Hebrew culture, they understood that you could be raised from the dead. And yet, Jesus said that concerning the resurrection, you really don't understand this thing. And so, walking with the Lord for many years now and, and being in ministry for 30 years, um, I've observed people and I've, I've listened to what they've said and, I, and I've watched their actions. And many, 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 many generations removed from the resurrection, I see that we're still travailing with this thing. The resurrection. Why did there have to be a resurrection? Not, was there a resurrection? There's probably nobody in this room today that doubts that Jesus rose from the dead. If you were here today, and you'd say, I don't really believe He rose from the dead. Could you please stand up so that we could all see you today? Nobody? Not that you would after that, huh? There's probably nobody here that really doubts that. Maybe some of you haven't really pondered it much, but there's probably nobody here today that's really doubted that Jesus rose from the dead. What you may not understand is what Jesus said. Maybe you don't understand why I had to. Why I had to rise from the dead. And what that means for us today. I want to address two groups of people today. The people maybe that would be kind of doubters. Maybe a, a little touch agnostic in your faith. Well, I don't know about all this. I don't really know if he was who he was. And, and if he really did this and he really did that. Or maybe you're just your faith is, is really low today. It's like, I don't know what to think about any of that. I used to feel something. I don't feel something anymore. Or maybe you're a person who just kind of doubts some of this because you've never really been exposed to the teachings of truth. I want to address that group first. Why? Why was the resurrection so important. I'm going to give you three reasons and they're 
three reasons. If you've been going to church for a while, you've probably heard these three reasons many times. And the first reason is simply this. Jesus rose from the dead. Fulfill his own prophecy. He had said multiple times, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise from the dead. He was fulfilling his own prophecy. Why? Why would that be so important? Because maybe if he said that and that is true, what else now did he say that we better go back and look at? Because there's nothing more extreme than saying, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise from the dead. What could have been said more extreme than that? And that happened. He kept his word. He fulfilled his own prophecy. The resurrection of Jesus gives validity to who he was and what he did. He was more than just a great guy doing great things. Jesus is not the first person on planet earth to be compassionate. Jesus is not the first, nor has he been the last person on planet earth that died for a cause. Many have died for causes. Many have died a martyr's death. To this day, people are dying a martyr's death in other countries for their faith. It wasn't just that he died, but why he died. If he's just another good guy, dying for another good cause, I doubt if the history books would have reflected too much on his life. Why does he stand out in the crowd? Why, why does what he did seem to stand out from everything else that every other human being has ever done? The resurrection. The resurrection gives credence to the death. The cross has credence. Because he rose from the dead. Many were crucified. He wasn't the first, nor was he the last to be nailed to a cross. There were thousands that were crucified. <coughs> but he was different. He rose from the dead. The resurrection gives credence and validity to everything Jesus ever said and ever did. Especially the work of the cross. Without the resurrection, the cross is just another cross. And their hanging was just another good guy, falsely accused. The resurrection is what gives power to the whole event. Without the resurrection, the cross is worthless. He fulfilled his own prophecy. The resurrection gave validity to who he was and what he did. But it confirmed. It confirmed some things about him that was very different. You see, Jesus... As far as we know, but there is a scripture that says that there would not be enough books in the libraries to contain everything he said and he did if it were all recorded. But what we do have, we know of three people that Jesus raised from the dead. By the way, the Gospels wasn't the first accounts of resurrections. There were some prophets that raised people from the dead. There was people after Jesus that raised people from the dead. Peter raised someone from the dead. But what had never been seen before was somebody raising himself from the dead. It never happened. Nobody had ever raised himself from the dead. People had been raised from the dead from an external power source. Ron's dead. I'm Jesus. I've got the power. I come and I raise him from the dead. That's no glory to Ron. That's all glory to me. That was my power that did that. We get a little blurb of the people that were raised from the dead, but nobody here today is a disciple of Lazarus. Well, why not? He was raised from the dead just like Jesus. Where's his dude? He was raised from the dead. Oh, Lazarus, there's the one that was raised from the dead. No, nobody glorifies the one raised from the dead. They may have some questions of, did you go into the light? What happened when you went to the light? But the one who gets the glory is the one with the power to do the raising. Jesus raised himself from the dead. He stands out in the crowd. Not just in the word of God, but in, but, but in the writings of people like Josephus and, and, and Hebrew historians that, that maybe they weren't there, but, but the story was on people's tongues. There, there were stories and he carried through for generations what had happened there. There was things, all kinds of things happening all the time every day in Hebrew culture. Why did this story of this man so stand out in the crowd? 
2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. We're still singing about it. We're still preaching about it. We're still living because of it. And we're living for it. It was the resurrection. The resurrection gave validity to everything he did. It gave credence to who he said he was. There were many before him and many after him that came saying, I am the Messiah. In Hebrew culture, that was a big deal. They had read the prophets. They knew the writings of the prophets. And if you were a little boy growing up in Hebrew culture, that was just the big thing. I wonder if I am this Messiah. And people grew up with Messiah complexes just like they have today. And Jesus would say, be careful. Those people would say, here's the Christ and there is the Christ. Because there's only one Christ. And I guess we give credence to the one who says, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ, I am the one sent by God to save you from your sins. The only way that there can be validity to that testimony is if we kill him, he's got the power to rise from the dead. Suddenly every word he spoke carries great power. Suddenly everything he promised carries great weight. Suddenly this guy who died on a cross, just like many others, when he said, but I'm dying for the sins of the world, suddenly we believe him. And it counts for something. To the doubters, that's why the resurrection is so important. Without it, none of it matters and it means nothing. For those of you that are here today and say, but I believe all that. I understand that. He had to rise from the dead to confirm he was who he said that he was. He gave credence to his death and the shedding of his blood. But I still agree with Jesus. There are many sitting in church chairs and church pews today that still don't understand for them personally, beyond the history and the theology, why he had to rise from the dead for them personally. <coughs> What it means for you today. More than just the theological beliefs. Like, well, no, I believe that he died. I believe that he rose from the dead. It's more than the Apostles' Creed. I believe that because of it, I'm, I'm, I'm washed with the, the blood of the Lamb. My sins are forgiven. I'm redeemed theologically. I understand that. And I believe that. But there's many people who believe that. And as I watch their lifestyle, it's still apparent to me that they still haven't seen in a personal way, understood in a personal way what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means for them. Here's the first thing that the resurrection of Jesus Christ should mean to you as a believer. Hope. Look at this in John chapter 11, starting with verse 17. On his arrival, speaking of this Lazarus, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them with the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, oh, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus is very adamant. She said, well, I know someday, someday, someday down the road, there's this last judgment or whatever's going on. I know someday he'll rise from the dead. She said, no, 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 you don't understand something. You don't understand that he who believes in me, they've already entered into a thing we call eternal life. Already. The great hope. The Bible calls it the great hope. Paul says if we don't have this great hope, what's the point? Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 1. You've heard this at many funerals probably. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. How many has ever heard that preached at funerals before? Why do we say that? Why do we use that at funerals? Because it's hope. And I'm not talking about hope the way that American culture uses the word hope. I'm talking about hope the way that Paul would have used the word hope. 
when we use the word hope, it's like it's not definite. We're not sure if this is going to happen or not. We just kind of hope it's going to. That's not the context of the word hope at all in the Bible. It's a for sure thing. Paul is saying, this is our hope. We are sure of this. Our faith is built on this. We have eternal life. Without eternal life, what's the point to anything? The most emotional, debilitating thought you can ever have is that there is no life after death. That when you end your life, it's just over. We bury you, you become worm food, it all ceases to exist. And some may say right now in the moment, but with all the pain that I'm in, I would welcome that. But we know people do that. We see people who take their life because they can't bear the weight of the hurt and the anguish. But most people are never thinking clear, obviously. Their emotional realm is shrunk down very small around their hurt. We make erratic decisions. Meanwhile, the rest of us are looking at the big picture of life. And if we'll stop and we'll think about it for just a moment today, you will have to admit with me, there's nothing more despairing than the thought that someday I'm going to grow old and I'm going to die. I'm just going to cease to exist forever and ever and ever. I just don't exist anymore. Maybe you don't think like that. I do think like that. Maybe you've never let your brain go there. My brain goes there whether I give it permission or not. It just thinks about stuff like that. And I'm not the only one, and that's why the Bible has made the promises it has, because more people do not think about things like that. What will happen when I die? Will I just cease to exist? It's despairing. The Old Testament prophet quoted it, and Paul quoted it again. He would say, Grave, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? How many has ever heard that before? Grave, where is your victory? Death. Where is your sting? Well, if you've ever lost anyone close to you, anyone that you love, you know death does sting. The grave does hurt. The point of the prophecy was to let us know, but if you know that you have eternal life, where's the sting? And that's why it's perfectly acceptable if you lose someone that you love, um, if, if their heart is, is right with God and they're, they're God's child and you know that they're in God's arms the minute they take their last breath, the very second, even though you may, may grieve for your own loss, rightfully so, but if you know they're ready to go, it changes things, doesn't it? It changes things. Because you know they have eternal life, you know you have eternal life, and you know, it's just a moment in time. Be over for you now. We're back together. Paul says, it's our hope. It's our hope. So, grave, where is your victory? Well, there is no victory if I already have entered into eternal life. Death, where is your sting? There is no sting if all you can do is kill my body. If that's all you can do, if that's the best you can do, what does that got to do with me living forever and ever and ever? When Jesus personally rose from the dead. He personally conquered death, hell, and the grave, the Bible said. He conquered it for Him, therefore He conquered it for anyone who He is inside of. Anyone who gives their life to Jesus and says, come into my heart and live, be my Lord, run my life, call the shots in my life. I'm your disciple. I'm going to follow you. I'm your kid. I'm your son. And for those people, for those people, He lives inside of you. Therefore, resurrection lives inside of you. Therefore, there is no sting to death. When my body dies, it will be time for my body to die, I assure you. And I'll be ready to get a new one. It's hope. It's hope. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to us today. The second thing that the resurrection of Jesus Christ does for us is bring us power. A stabilizing power. Look at Philippians 3.10. A passage I've used here several times this year already. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. <laughs> the next part we don't like. And the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. Do you understand that if I become like Him in His death, I become like Him in His resurrection life? Is the point, is the context. But it's funny because Paul refers to the resurrection as a very specific power that he wants in his life. 
It's a part of God that he wants in his life. There's a power there. And, and, and the context of that whole passage speaks of, of, of a stability. There's a stabilizing effect to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ inside of us. Somehow it's not just a supernatural thing that falls out of the heavens. Sometimes, somehow it, it, it's more than that. It's, it's the understanding, the, the revelation, the getting it of the resurrection of Jesus Christ does something to my mind. It transfers to my heart. And somehow understanding I have eternal life somehow brings a stabilization to my world. It puts everything in perspective. I mean, you guys will admit you whined and cried about some things in life that just wasn't that big a deal once you looked in the rearview mirror back at it. I'm going to say it's happened hundreds of times. I didn't even say thousands of times. It can become emotional basket cases over a little bit. Things that just are so insignificant. Things that we get all tore up about. Let something really serious happen and suddenly it gives scale, doesn't it? You think you're having a bad day because you're running late for work, you had a flat tire, your light bill's a day late, um, hair's not doing right today, do like me, just get over it. I got over it years ago. As my hair let go, I just let go of the whole emotional side of that life. It's like it's better to love than lost and never loved at all, right Jackie? I had it, I loved it, and when I had it, maybe I had it. It was touching the back of my belt. I'm telling you, when I had it, I had it. So, you live in your memories. And when I look in the mirror, that's still who I see. It's not who you see. It's who I see. Go for a routine checkup that day and get diagnosed with terminal cancer and see how it changes your perspective on everything else you were complaining about. Get a call from school. Could you please come uh, meet us at the ER? Your, your son, your, your daughter has fallen off the monkey bars and, 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 and we think there might be something broke. Meet us at the ER. Suddenly, everything else you were complaining about that day, it, it dissipates. It's gone. Well, that's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ does for me. When I let myself stop and think about it. It brings scale to everything else. Because no matter what's going on, no matter how this case will may be, I'm thinking, but I have eternal life. And when I balance the two, I'm going, suddenly there's scale to this little thing, and it's not quite as big as it used to be. See, there's a lot of things that are a big deal in life. If when I die, I just die. I cease to exist. But if I've got eternal life, if I'm secure in Him, suddenly every problem in life, even if it is a really bad report, suddenly there's even scale to that. I've watched people like Stephen Curtis Chapman through the, through, the, through the loss of that beautiful daughter. And of course we had a, such a connection with that family um, through the whole Chinese adoption thing in there. Um, he was actually our inspiration, one of our huge inspirations to do what we did. And his music had just, what, was just really had a special place in my heart. I was always drawn to Stephen Curtis Chapman. And, and uh, when he started adopting from China, it got my attention. And we were trying to adopt, and we were just trying to make things work, and it was falling apart everywhere we went. And suddenly the pieces come together, and, and he was one of the people God used to get my attention. And then when we started the adoption process, he, they, had a, they offered us help. And they were willing to finish paying for, for the adoption already because it cost so much money, but you guys were so awesome. I, I, I just had to come and say, look, thanks, but no thanks. Give it to someone who needs it. Um, and then when the little middle daughter, they adopted three beautiful daughters from China, and when the middle one tragically got run over and killed, and, and I'm watching the footage from this funeral, and I'm, I'm listening to him talk in all these interviews, and, and I'm watching the strength that they have, and knowing that they're carrying a, a, a load of grief that I can't relate to. You see, it's one thing to lose a, a parent, or an aunt, or an uncle, or a grandparent, or, or even a sibling or something, or a good friend. But to lose a child, that's a whole different realm. And then maybe some of you in your day has tasted of that sting. It's a weight. And I watched Stephen Curtis Chapman carry that thing gallantly. It seemed like there was a strength that began to come up out of him and his wife in a time that no one would judge them for just collapsing on the floor and falling apart. And I have no doubt they wept many tears. But there was a strength that rose out of him that they would have never tapped into if such a tragedy would have never happened. It was the very resurrection power of God. It was power 
A stabilizing force that, that stabilizes emotions. What will stabilize our emotions, America? Basket cases. We're more stressed out than anybody in the world, and we're more blessed than anybody in the world. We've got more conveniences and more comforts and more prosperity than anybody on the planet ever has, and yet we're the most emotional. I've traveled the world. I've never seen any place like America so blessed and so emotional. We stay tore up about everything all the time. I'm telling you, we need a revelation of the resurrection. We need to get some scale in our life. We need to get some perspective on our lives. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives me great hope that I would not have without His resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives me a power that I would not have without the resurrection. Look at Romans 8, verse 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His spirit who lives in you. He'll even give life to your mortal body because of His resurrection. And Paul is dealing with a power there uh, from the resurrection of Jesus Christ that now is inside of us. And he's saying, man, it doesn't even matter what the sin is that's waiting at the door, that's dogging me, that's haunting me, that I'm battling. He didn't say that there wasn't. He's, he's talking, this, this whole passage is dealing with a wrestling match between the spirit and the flesh. He's saying, but there's a power in me because of the resurrection. And I'm going to win this thing. When we get a revelation, a personal revelation, and we begin to build faith upon that revelation, I'm telling you, we're going to stop struggling so much, breaking some of the bondages in our life. If you have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in you, you can break that addiction. You can break it. If you've been dogged by hurt and disappointment and broken dreams for years, it's completely changed who you are. If the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is in you, can break that thing. You can break it. There's a power from the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus gives me hope. It gives me power. And the bottom line to all this, it gives me life. How many has been coming on Wednesday nights the last few weeks? Boy, have we been having a time. My goodness. I almost hate it. I was telling someone this week, it's like, I almost hate it because this, you know, this season isn't going to last forever. Always. At some point, you know, we're going to exhaust that thing. And then I'm just, you know, I'm wondering what then. The Word of God is opening it up to us through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that book is becoming what it is, a, a revelation, an unveiling, a seed of who Jesus is. Look at this passage. Some of you have become very familiar with in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. When I saw him, Jesus, this is John, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. By the way, this imagery is just chock full of all kinds of theological nuggets. He said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. You have no idea what good news that is for you. Amen. If He's inside of you, that is incredible news. Amen. That news changes everything. Amen. Everything. Your sickness, your relationships, your battles in life, the things that are just haunting you and dogging you and weighing you down, the revelation of that will tra change you, transform you. Amen. It'll change your life. Jesus said, I was dead, now I'm alive again. We've been here on Wednesday night. We've been looking at the, the letters to the church, a mature church, the, the seven aspects of making a church mature. And every single letter has compliments, <laughs> rebukes. A couple of guys got off the hook. Promises. Compliments, rebukes, and promises. That's what the letters to the church in the Revelation of Jesus Christ are composed of. There's seven or eight promises, seven promises, because some of them are collective. They mean the same things, they're just redundant. 
Listen to some of these promises. It's the bulk of the things that Jesus promised for those who would follow Him, receive Him, share their life with Him, and let Him share His life with Him. Walk with God. Become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let me use some pure American terminology here. Get saved. Understand, biblically, that's a process that will last the rest of your life. In American culture, we turn it into an abracadabra and an altar. However, back in Scripture, it, was a, it had a point, a beginning, where people heard something. It touched their heart. It began to draw them. It began to, it began to do something strange inside their heart. They began to come and listen some more and follow. And, and, and as they would listen, they would begin to draw to it. And they would begin to follow it. They begin to give their life away to it. That's what the Bible calls salvation. And it's a process that continues and continues and continues. At what point does God look at us and say, there's my child? I don't know. I'm not the judge. But I'd say it's pretty early on knowing God and His grace. Listen to these promises that are given to those who become the children of God and that overcome life, that learn to, to overcome and use his, his, his stabilizing resurrection power in their life. He says, I'm going to let you the tree of life. Life. The tree of life. He says, you'll not be hurt by the second death. Listen, listen to the thing here. He's talking about life and death. I'm going to give you the tree of life to eat. You're not going to be hurt by the second death. I'm going to give you the crown of life. I'm going to give you hidden manna, hidden manna, uh, and, and the white stone. The hidden manna, if you were here Wednesday night, referred to spiritual sustenance to keep your spiritual man alive. The white stone was a, was a holy invitation to a wedding feast to keep your spiritual man alive. It says, I'll never block your name out from the book of life. Life, 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 life. You see, we're not the only ones concerned about living forever. God knows that, so His promises revolve around making sure you understand life, 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 tree of life, crown of life, no second death, never blocked your name out of the, the book of life. He's wanting you to know something. The most important thing that you desire, that you chase after, life and life abundant. Jesus is saying, this is what I have for you. This is what I brought to you. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life abundant. Life and life abundant. Life and life abundant. Life and life abundant. How do I have life? Life abundant means full life, not a piece of life, not partial life. Whole life. Full life. Well, how do I get that? Just because I go to church? Because I sing songs? Because I listen to Pastor Scott preach? Because I serve in the nursery? I know people do all those things, and they're dead in the mackerel. I don't know why the mackerel gets picked on so much. The flounder to me looks the deadest when it's just laying there on the dock. It should be flat as a flounder. Um, nevertheless, I digress. Where's the life? Where's the life in the body of Christ? And why isn't it there? Where is the breakdown? Where is the failure? What have we missed? Why is it that when I step into the body of Christ, I see a lot of misery just like in the world? A lot of sad faces just like in the world? A lot of griping and complaining just like out in the world? A lot of woe is me just like out in the world? A lot of people are just empty. We're just as medicated as the people out there in the world. We're just as distraught as the people in the world. We're just as nervous as the people in the world. And I'm trying to ask myself, what are we missing here? Because we're preaching the Word of God. And I'm telling you what I believe it is. I believe that we just not have stilled ourselves long enough, intentionally disciplined our mind to ponder and understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ and understand what that means for me, Amen. for you. It changes everything. I don't care what my deal is. I don't care what my problem is. I have eternal life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All is well. It's okay. I can get through it, and if I don't get through it, what's the worst case scenario? I'm dead. Well, am I really dead? So there's no worst case scenario. There's no worst case scenario for you and I. It changes everything. So you're having a bad day. Get used to it. It won't be the last. You think you're having a bad day today? Hold on. There's some worse ones than this coming. Don't oh, prophesy that over me. I don't have to prophesy. It's just life, baby. It's going to happen. Aches and pains and things falling apart and the washing machine doesn't work. And it's going to happen. Or what's going to 
going to change all that? What, what's going to separate us and make us different from the world? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what. Amen. And we should be filled with, what, what's all these problems in the Bible? I'm going to come to give you life and life abundant. And your joy is going to be made full. And the, the fruit of the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And go, oh, man, where's the fruit on our trees, man? Our trees are barren. What are we missing? We're not of the world. We're not like the world for one reason. Because we believe Jesus Christ died for us, redeemed us back to God, rose from the dead, conquered death, hell, and the grave. I've already entered eternal life. You can't kill me. You can't kill me. Put a gun to my head and pull the trigger. You accomplished nothing. What can be a worse day than that? And yet that's okay. I noticed this week. When God wants me to see something, He puts me in redundant situations and He magnifies things to make sure that I see humanity at large and what we're dealing with. So I had one of those weeks. And everywhere I went, it was like I was in a zombie movie everywhere I went. That should be one of our themes. Do two or three weeks on the living dead. <laughs> sure, I'm not just... I pastor living dead people all the time. Why should I watch the TV show? Oh, come on. You should have chuckled at that. Oh, don't lose opportunities to be happy. Be happy. I, 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 I watch zombie stuff, okay? Crucify me. Some of y'all say, what? well, when we were kids, it was, it was mummies, Jack. It was mummies, not zombies. And, you know, it's the same old, same old. Mummies and zombies, except for that one Will Smith movie, you know, mummies and zombies, and so you go, and man, it was just like, man, just get this movie back here, keep it away from this guy. No matter how slow the zombies move, no matter how fast the, the victims are running, you just can't get away from them. What's up with that? I use my phone for two things, Tony. Half the time I use it for communication, the other time I'm playing stupid zombies on my iPhone. <laughs> and they just stand there and go, yeah. And just start shooting them, man. They try to hide behind barrels and stuff. But they're zombies, they're not that smart, really. I don't know if you know that, zombies are not smart. They have no life, they're the living dead. They're dead, but their body's alive, but they're dead inside. What a picture. Everywhere I went this week, it's like every every restaurant I went to was waited on by zombies. And every place I went for fast food, the person at the cash register was a zombie. And everywhere I went, I even had some pastor friends this week that turned into zombies. And they were just like, the, you know the deer in the headlight look? Like, hey, yo. They won't take orders, and, and, and these youngins, and not always youngins, and friends at the retro, it's like, I help you? <laughs> yeah, man, give me some McNuggets, man. I saw that pink stuff squirting out through that funnel, man. You fry that stuff up. <laughs> and no matter what I ordered, there were always multiple follow-up questions of which I had already given all the answers. <laughs> and that's all. That's all. When I say that's all, I mean that's all. <laughs> And it's like everyone had that deer in the head like look and everyone seemed so sad and everyone just seemed so disconnected with life and everywhere I went it's just like God was pulling back the, the, the veil of life and he says son I want you to look at what's going on in my children they're not living man I've done everything I ever needed to do to fill them with life make them happy man fill them with joy the worst things that can ever happen to them are not the worst things because they have eternal life why are they so sad? Oh God, I don't know, but it's starting to make me sad now. We've got to get a revelation of the resurrection because it will change our life. It will change your life. Romans 10.9. I didn't give you that one, did I? So I just better quote it because it's, it's our magic wand of how you get saved. And uh, you've heard it quoted many times that 
that, uh, that you must believe, you must confess that Jesus is Lord, you must believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead. By the way, that's not a magic wand thing. There's a context to that. Uh, it's not just saying, oh, painted by the numbers. That's our legalistic mindsets that battle that stuff. It's like, okay, um, I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Check. Um, you are Lord. Check. <laughs> now I'm saved. That's not the context of how all that is supposed to be working. It's stuff that's supposed to be uh, percolating in here. Um, I believe Jesus has the right to be the Lord of my life. He should own me. And uh, it seemed that Paul considered it foundational to salvation that we believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It was so contingent that Paul believed that unless you could really grab that thing for yourself, it would really be impossible for you to really be saved. That's how powerful it was. So what's in your heart today? What's going on in your life? And who am I talking to and say, you know what? I'm kind of a little bit offended because I feel like you were picking on me today because I'm really sad right now. It's like, well, there's things that make us sad. Please understand the balance. Things make us sad, make us grieve. We have pains. We have afflictions. We have things, surprises that happen in life. We're going to respond to emotionally. I I'm not getting on you about it. Like, I do that stuff myself. I'm talking about in the big picture of life. When we, when we stand back and we're going to, wait a minute, let me, let me get some scale to this thing. Oh, yeah. He rose from the dead. He lives in me. Death, hell, the grave, it's already conquered all is well. Yes. We've got to get that. We've got to get that. Today I want to pray for us for just that. That we'll get that. That we'll get that. So we can get some joy. There's plenty of excuses not to be happy. And I can only give you one good reason to be happy. He's alive. Yeah. Amen. There's plenty of reasons to be disappointed about life, but life has not worked out the way that you planned. I can only give you one reason why it's still on course. He's alive. I can justify along with you all the heartache and the pain of life and the surprises. And I can only counterbalance it with one thing. The biggest surprise that ever happened in creation. He arose. Changes everything. It's the counterbalance to everything. Where are you at in all this? I want to pray for you today, and I want to pray for two groups of people. First of all, I want to, I want to pray for those who would come in here today and say, you know what, it's Easter. It just seemed like it was right to go to church today. And um, some friends invited me, but i got to tell you, Pastor Scott, my life is all over the place. I don't know where I'm at, just to be very honest with you. I don't, I don't know how God sees me. I don't know how He views me. My life is a wreck right now. I'm all over the board, but, but I know it's because I have not given my life to Jesus Christ. I, I, I am not His child. And I just got to tell you that for you, whatever condition your life is in, that is how it's supposed to be for you. By God's design. You got life with Him and you got existence without Him. That's just how it works. But I got good news. You're in the right place at the right time today. And we don't have to smack you in the head. And we don't have to drag you around the room. And we don't have to take you through any kind of processes today to change all that. you just got to come to a place in your heart and say, I want that to change today. I want to make Jesus my Lord. I want to give my life to Him today. I, 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 want, to, I want to take my whole world and just put it in the hands of God today and say, here, take my life. He's already forgiven your sins. People ask me when I got saved, say 2,000 years ago. That's when I got saved. I was saved before I was born. Now, I didn't, I didn't find the faith to accept that for myself until 30 years ago. But your sins are forgiven. There's no wrestling match there. You just have to accept that with simple faith. He died for my sins, and I accept that today. I want to pray for you, because in your own heart, as you give your life to Jesus, that today that you will feel the warmth of that embrace from God for all the rest of us. Um, we say, I am a child of God. And we're in one place or the other in our life right now where, where we are not walking out the promises of God with this life thing. We're walking life out without any hope, without any power, and without any life. That is not God's design. But where do I start, Pastor Scott? With, the, with this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let that knowledge transfer to your heart 
begin to affect your faith in how you're living your life. That's how it works. There's no magic wand. I can't, I can't put my hand on you today and pray for you that suddenly you have a deep revelation and that your faith changes and you walk out of your full life. It doesn't work that way. It works through what you hear and you take what you hear and you let it transfer to your heart and it becomes a foundation, a belief in your life. And you begin to live based on that belief. I want you stand with me this morning. I want everyone in here just so you can get focused on what God's wanting to do right now. I, I, what a, just close your eyes. And let me just ask this question while everyone's just kind of focusing on their own life with God right now. Uh, that first batch that I want to pray for, you say, you know what, today I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm tired of this, of this world. I'm tired of this life. I'm tired of just running. I'm tired of wrestling. I, I need something different to happen in my life. And I'm convinced today that giving my life to Jesus Christ is the answer. Can, can, you, just, can you just kind of put your hand up and wave it around a little bit? Because I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I want to pray for you. And then we're going to pray for everybody else. I thank you, Father, today for those who, who have been honest enough to say that um, their way is not working out and now they're ready to give their life over to you and let you take their life and do something incredible with it. I know, Lord, that incredible stuff's not going to happen today. That's going to be day by day as their disciples, they learn to walk with you. The change will come in time, day by day, just like at creation. But I know also in this moment, Lord, that you can affect them with, with a great, great sense of comfort in their heart. That you see them and you know them. And you're doing something in their life right now. And so I ask that you do that. May they feel the warmth of your spirit, Lord. May they feel, may they feel your love. May they feel your forgiveness today. May they feel your happiness, Lord, for what's going on in their heart right now. Father, for all the rest of us in here, we admit that depending on what day it is, we're, we're a little bit unstable with our walk. Just living as human beings, we're just, we're, we're just, we're not doing real well on some days, Lord. And we're challenging ourselves today and asking ourselves, what are we missing? Father, I'm convinced that this is the missing piece. We're not looking at everything in life through the filter of your resurrection. Teach us today, Holy Spirit, to do that. Help us, Holy Spirit, to retain what we've talked about today. When we leave here, the rest of this day, tomorrow, next week, the week after that, the months to follow, the years to follow, Lord, help us to retain the seed that is in the soul today and we'll remember to, to filter everything that happens in life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, for anyone that's visiting today that's in seeker mode, they're just looking for, they're looking for something in life and they're not even sure what it is. Lord. They just know that life is not it's not panning out the way that they hoped and they're looking for change. I pray that today, Lord, that, that those people would know that they've stepped into a place where there's an opportunity for that change. Lord, the rest of this day, man, we just continue in celebration. If you agree with that for your lives, just say amen. amen. Thank you guys for being here today. Really, really, really appreciate it. Nothing going on here this week. Nothing to see here, okay? Come back next Sunday and we'll get back in.